play around with the piano a little bit. Have you guys ever taken a simple song like Twinkle Twinkle Little Star? Can you play that? You can play that. Thank you. 
And that is what we're going to be talking about today. We're going to talk about different left-hand patterns. We're going to talk about different ways to learn theory. I call it the theory fundamentals. Emphasis on the word fun. F-U-N. Where we take the theory and we apply it. It's not just theory. Sometimes we think of theory on one side, and then we think of being able to play on the other side. And then we try to figure out how to cross and get this bridge so we can understand what we're doing. And, and I, I had a student one time and I said, can you play a C major sixth chord? And he said, oh yeah. I said, what can you do with it? I don't know. And I said, well, C major is C E G. That's a C major triad. Come on in. I said, what if we put the sixth interval up on top? That's a C major sixth chord. I said, if you break that apart with the left hand, it's like a walking bass pattern. Well, we're just playing C, E, G, A, C, E, G, A. What if we put the minor seventh interval up on top and we have a B flat? C, E, G, A, B flat, A, G, A. started out playing the string bass and orchestra in fifth grade, and I played all through junior high, and I kept taking private lessons in high school, but in ninth grade I went to the dark side, and I got an electric bass guitar, and I loved playing that electric bass. It was so cool. Do you want to come in? Are we about ready to start? We're going to have Terry Gerald's already introduced kick things off. <laughs> <laughs> I've known Gerald for a long time, and he knows what he's talking about. That's all I can say. Uh, and then some, uh, he does a lot of improv. Uh, ad lib, improv. He knows every one of those modes. He can play it in any key that you want, even in the key of Q. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> he has three children, one's six, a daughter six. Uh, she's in sixth grade, she's 11. I know, she grows up. I've known day. Gerald for a long time. <laughs> <laughs> she, she's 11. She was six once upon a time. Yes. And then you have a. And then we have uh, we have two little boys. One is five. He's in kindergarten, and we have a little two-year-old boy who is a bundle of joy. He's so uh, sweet. One girl. Well, they all are. I mean, they all are. <laughs> so they are one. So I'm going to turn the time over to Gerald and. You'll learn a lot today. That's all I can say. Uh, every time he comes in, there, there's something that he has going on, and he just, he just, he knows what's going on. You're very Gerald. kind. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you so much. When, so my name is Gerald Simon. I just live over in Fruit Heights, close by. When I was younger, it was a commandment to play the piano. It was the eleventh commandment, thou shalt play the piano. <laughs> Closely followed by the twelfth commandment, thou shalt not whine about playing the piano. We actually had a wooden plaque that says, thou shalt not whine, and it was placed right over the piano. <laughs> so as we practiced, we looked up and we saw this sign that said, thou shalt not whine. We thought, great. Yeah. Every morning, my father would come in and he was my alarm clock. Okay? I don't know if any of you guys can relate with this, but my father came into my room five in the morning, every morning. And he would flip on the lights, on and off. And at the top of his lungs, he would sing one of two songs. Okay? He would sing either, Oh, What a Beautiful Morning, or he would sing, Good morning, good morning, it's great to stay up late, good morning. Good morning. And he'd go through and sing that while doing the light switch up and down as fast as he could. Every morning. That was my alarm clock. And then I would go and spend half an hour on the piano, and then half an hour on the organ, and then I had to learn another instrument. We had to learn at least three instruments. Anything above three was optional, but we had to learn at least three instruments. I think I was in third grade 
when I first found out that everyone doesn't play an instrument. Because I turned to my friend and I said, so what time do you wake up in the morning to practice your instruments? And he said, instruments? And I said, well, you know, at least one of your instruments, what time do you wake up? He said, I don't play any instruments. I said, you don't play any? At all? And he said, no, I, I, don't, I play sports. I, I don't play instruments. And I, I honestly believed up until third grade that that's what you did. You woke up, and you spent half an hour on the piano, and then half an hour on the organ, which, by the way, is not a second instrument. That's just an extension of the first instrument. And then I went to the string bass. This was before going to school, an hour and a half on instruments. Before school, okay? I always tell my piano students, if you have nothing to complain about, <laughs> if someone asks you to practice the piano. But my father, he would always challenge me to do more. I was classically trained, but my father would always push me to do a little bit more. And I loved it because my father would say, try this style. Try that style. What if you take it up half a step? Play it in another key. Now, he would never actually show me what to do. <laughs> he would never explain the theory. I had to go figure it out for myself. But I came up with a book called Variations on Mary Had a Little Lamb. Sandy, can you grab that for me? It's on the far right. Mary, Mary Had a Little Lamb. You guys all know that, right? That's my beautiful wife, Sandy, by the way. <laughs> it's all true. <laughs> so, this is the book Variations on Mary Had a Little Lamb, and this is a tribute to my father because when I was younger, I would play Mary Had a Little Lamb, and my father would say, what about this style, or try that style, and he would give me ideas, but he would never tell me how to do it. Now, can you imagine telling a little child to figure out how it would sound if Mary went to China? <laughs> and then sending them on their way and saying, now go figure that out. Now, I didn't know at the time, but if you put a fourth interval above the melody line, it gives it that Asiatic Indian type quality. And he would say, great. What about ragtime? What about blues? What? And, and I love doing it. My teachers did not like it. I can remember... Because they would have a long procession, a long line of composers who had composed a brand new piece specifically for this nobility, either the king or the queen, and, and they would play their piece. Well, the other musicians were out listening. They were out in, in the hall just listening, and Mozart, guess what he would do? He would walk in, sit down, and instead of playing the piece he had composed, he would play, note for note, what he had heard the previous composer perform for the king, but he would embellish it and do more, and they hated Mozart for it. I mean, he was despised because he was basically mocking the previous musician and saying, oh, you think you wrote this for the king? Let me show you what you can really do with it. And then he would play his piece that he had composed. So, I'm going to talk a little bit today about different left-hand patterns, and I'll introduce some of the books. I have come out with 21 music books, uh, original compositions that I've composed. 
And let me tell you how I began composing those. The first two books that I composed and created, An Introduction to Scales and Modes, was the first book I ever did. And then Variations on Mary Had a Little M was the second book. And they're fun. Probably not the most exciting books. I mean, they're great, but Introduction to Scales and Modes, for me, I wanted to explain about Ionian, Dorian, Phrygian, Lydian, Mixolydian, Aeolian, Locrian. Talk about how to change keys and play one song in different styles, different modes. And probably not the most exciting book for everyone, but for me, I thought it was fantastic. And then Variations on Mary Had a Little Lamb, I wanted to have different arrangements where I teach students how to take one song and change it up. So we did Mary Had a Little Lamb, and then I did Mary Took Her Lamb to a Swingin' Jazz Club. Mary's Lamb Had the Blues. Mary Took Her Lamb to a 50's Rock Concert. Mary and Her Lamb Live with Indians. Mary's Lamb Started in a Western. And then we did Mary and Her Lamb Dance the Waltz to teach waltz. Mary's Lamb Meets Mozart, where I wanted to have kind of a fun little left hand pattern. Kids, they'll have nightmares about Mary's Lamb dying. I said, well, okay, we'll just go to a funeral. So we created this minor sounding piece. After these two books, I had I had about 40-something students at the time, and right now I have about 45, 50 students right now that I teach. I went from having about 40 piano students to having 90-something students. It was insane. No one should do <laughs> I was teaching Monday through Saturday like 10 to 12 hour days. Which, when you're teaching, and these are one on one lessons, these are not group lessons. These are all one on one lessons. And we won't do that again. <laughs> but, as a result of that, what happened, piano teachers had sent students to me and parents because they wanted me to, I guess, motivate their piano student. Maybe that's what I get for having a company called Music and Motivation. And so my problem then became that these new piano students who came to my studio wanted nothing to do with music at all. I mean, they would come and they would sit on the piano bench, they would fold their arms and say, I'm not, I'm not playing the piano. I'm not touching the piano. And it wasn't that they did not have motivation. They hated the piano. I mean, they despised it. And so I came up with an idea. And for me, it was a challenge. For them, it became a game. And I said, I'm going to compose a new song during your lesson. And what I want you to do, take it home, play it, maybe perform it for family or friends, and then come back and we'll see what you think. And I said, here's what we're going to do. You tell me the key signature that you want to play in. You tell me the time signature, you tell me what style of music you want me to compose the piece in. Many even came up with the title. And I said, during your 30 minute lesson, I will compose it, I will notate it in finale, print it off, and send it home with you. And then you need to practice during the week what I have you play. And they said, okay. And many of them, it became a game. The Cool Songs for Cool Kids series, we have primer, 
level, we have book one, book two, and book three. Each book has 21 fun, cool songs in them. Except for the last one, which has 10, because each one is about four or five pages long. The kids, all of these songs were composed during piano students' lessons. Okay? And they would tell me what they wanted me to compose. Let me go to Cool Songs for Cool Kids, book one. I had a piano student who said, I only want to do C, D, E, F, and G. That's it. And I said, okay. And he said, but with the left hand, I only want to do two notes with the left hand. And I said, you only want to do two notes with the left hand? And he said, that's it. And so I said, well, what if we do C to G? And I want them to learn the theory. So I said, let's talk about intervals. If you have one, two, three, four, five, those are harmonic intervals. C to D is the harmonic second. C to E is the harmonic third. C to F is the harmonic fourth. C to G is the harmonic fifth. And so we can give them fancy names like primary unison first, major second, major third, perfect fourth, perfect fifth. Those are what they are called. If you break them apart, they are melodic. Think melody. So melodic second, melodic third, melodic fourth, melodic fifth. And he said, okay. So then I said, how about we do a melodic fifth interval with the left hand, and with the right hand we just play C, D, E, F, G. So I came up with this. Song with this. 
And I said, how about we have that be your left-hand part, where we go down, doing that, whatever rhythm we select. And I said, with the right hand, how about you just rock back and forth between C and G, and then I'll put in a B four times in the piece somewhere. And he said, okay. And this is what I came up with. just off of our lessons because of everything that, I mean, he, but he was an engineer. He had that mind and, and he needed everything written out and detailed and complete. I thought, you are fantastic. You, you are great. But we were working on the blues pentascale. So I said this, and I need to have a volunteer to come help me. One of the students, do we have any volunteers who, I think, I think you've been nominated. See that? Uh, a friendly helping, you know, get up there. Come here. Huh? So, she's going to help us learn the blues pentascale. Take a seat. This is your throne. All right. So, this is what I said to him. I said, do you know how to play a C minor chord? Do you know how to play a C minor chord? Okay. I'll play with your right hand. Okay. So, we have C, E flat, G. Now, put your second finger on the E flat. Okay. What I told him, and this is the way I teach all students, adults or children from here on out, this is the way I teach them, I say play a C minor triad, or any minor triad, one, two, five is your fingering, the fourth finger is half a step below the pinky, so your pinky is on G, fourth finger is going to play F sharp, see that? The third finger is half a step below the fourth finger, so that's F. C, E flat, F, F sharp, G, ba 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 ba. C minor triad, 1, 2, 5, C, E flat, G. Fourth finger is half a step below the pinky. Third finger, 
half the step below the fourth finger. Can you do it? You're an all-star, see? She did it! Okay? She did it! Now, we're going to swing that, and the way I tell them, play long, short, long, short, long, short, long, short, long. Okay? Before I would say, have you ever seen a drunken sailor? And no one had ever seen one until Pirates of the Caribbean came along. And then everyone, Jack Sparrow, I mean, they all knew, you know, this is what a drunken sailor looks like. So I would say, just think. <laughs> You don't have to sweat unless you want to, and then I can't stop you. But try that. Try that. Perfect. And then I said to him, can you do the same thing on F? So go up to F, play an F minor triad, and use the one, two, five fingering, just like we said before. Yep. The fourth finger is half a step below the fifth finger, and the third finger is half a step below the fourth finger. So now we have F, A flat, B flat, B natural, C. Okay, can you do it on G? So play a G minor triad. Yep, and we're going to do one, two, five as the fingering, and the fourth finger half a step below the pinky. Third finger, half step below the fourth finger. Try it. Now, do you know what is so great about teaching students how to do this? It helps them learn how to arrange and even compose instantly because it does not matter what rhythm you use with those five notes, it doesn't matter what order you play those five notes, it always sounds great. Watch this. Pretend like your hand is numbered 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. I'm just going to count the numbers 1 through 5. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. C, E flat, F, F sharp, G, okay? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Try that. Now try this. 1, 1, 2, 1, 2, 3.
during his lesson and printed it out. He took it home and he perfected it. And then he even tried to do it, of course, the engineer mind. You know, he started thinking, well, if that pattern applies to C, and I'm just playing a C minor triad, fourth finger, half a step below the pinky, third finger, half a step below the fourth finger, he came back because I had told him to do this and really get that pattern with both hands. And so he said, if I play the minor triad in every key, then I just follow that pattern of, you play the minor chord, one, two, five, fourth finger, half a step below the pinky, third finger, half a step below the fourth finger.
were creating a chord progression that we went from C to A down to F and then G. So go down to F. this handout. Here it has 19 different, down the side we have 19 different left hand patterns and all I did, I went through and put the numbers referring to 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. Look at number 1 and some of these I wrote out musically how it looks on the front and on the back. I wrote and only to number 13. But look at number one. It's the 1 5 pattern. See that? Now that's 1 5. We can play them as eighth notes or we can play them as quarter notes. Look at the next one 1 5 8. 1 5 8. Well, I'm playing C, G, and then C. 1 5 8. It doesn't matter where I go. What if I went to F? One, five, eight. What if I went to A? What if I went to G? One, five, eight. One, five, eight. One, five, eight. One, five, eight. Doesn't matter where I go. One, five, eight. That's all I'm doing. Well, I start changing these patterns. Look at number three. One, five, eight, five, one. Students, I will have students try this and just start creating, and it's like they become David Longs, because this is what David does in a lot of his pieces. He has that one, five, eight, five, left hand pattern. Well, with the right hand, guess what I tell them to do? Take a third interval. If I have C to G, that's a third interval. Well, D to F is a third interval. E to G is a third interval. I can just go up, and I'm just moving in thirds.
Do you see down here where it says interval, inverted in intervals? This is a fun thing for students to try. It says a first becomes an eighth, a second equals a seventh. If you have two notes, you can change the position. If I have C and E, C is on the bottom, E is on the top. But what if I want to play E and C? I'm still playing the same two notes. I've just changed the position. C and E, or E and C. See that? So, a third interval equals a sixth interval. If you have C to E, that is a third interval. If you have E to C, that's a sixth interval because from E up to the C is six notes. One, two, three, four, five, six. Watch what happens if I do my sixth interval with my right hand while my left hand plays one, five, eight, five. So in here, I explain the theory of what I'm doing with every single piece, and then when we get to that piece, that's what I'm teaching them. So watch. The first piece is called Morning Star, and it says this piano solo uses a 1, 5, 1, 5, 1, 5, 1, 5 left hand pattern, where the pinky and thumb rock back and forth, creating a steady pulse, C and th uh, C is 1, 5 is G, and we're just going back and forth. So I did this, the right hand crosses over, to 
understand the theory and what to do with it. I need to have another helper come up. Do I have any volunteers who want to come up? I'll do it. I've never oh, actually been a volunteer. Actually, I don't think you ever have in I all know. the years I've done this. Okay. Let me have you are sweet. So what we're going to have her do, we're going to talk about chords, triads. This is a fun thing for you to do. Three note chords. Now, if you have three notes, how many positions do you have of the chord? Three positions. Because you have three notes. And many times, I will have a book up on the piano, and I will say, what is this? And the piano students look at me like I'm really dumb, which, I mean, it's, there's a lot of truth to that. But they look at me and they say, it's a book. And then I do this and I say, oh, what is it now? And they look at me like, I really have lost it. And they say, it's a book. And then I say, what about now? And at this, by this point, they're, they think, I just need to be institutionalized, you know, bring up the straitjacket. I mean, this guy really has problems. And I tell them, it doesn't matter which way I turn this, it's always a book, right? So, if you have a C major chord, C, E, G, we have three notes. C, E, G. That means we have three positions. It does not matter which note is on top or which note is on the bottom. It will always be a C major chord. So, let me show you. I'm going to have you play a C major chord with your right hand. One, three, five. What I tell students, I tell them, look, there's a space in between each finger. If there is a space in between each finger and the keys are all evenly spaced, whatever note is on the bottom is the name of the chord. So this is C major root position. We know it's a C major chord because it's evenly spaced. Now, if I take the C from the bottom, instead of playing C, E, G, if I put the C up on top, it's going to be E, G, C. That's a C major chord first inversion. And I ask the students, how do you know the name of that chord just by looking at it? So play a C major chord, first inversion, root position. Now put your thumb on E, G, and C. If you notice, there are two up top, two keys on the top, and there's one down below. You have your thumb on the E, then there's an F key, and then you have your second finger on G. Well, there's one key down below, but there are two keys up top because... We have A and B right here, and then the pinky's up on C. I tell students it's top-heavy. Anytime the chord is top-heavy, whatever note is on top is the name of the chord. So this is a C. It's top-heavy. It's C major chord, first inversion. If I put the E up on top, now it's bottom-heavy. I have two notes down here on the bottom. I have G and C, and I have these two in between them. And then I only have the E up on top, so it's bottom-heavy. If it's bottom heavy, whatever note is in the middle is the name of the chord. So, play this just like that. Root position, first inversion, second inversion. Three notes, so we have three positions. If you have a four note chord, you have four positions. Root position, first inversion, second inversion, third inversion, back up to root position. So, you know how to play root position, first inversion, second inversion. So what? What does that mean? Who cares? What can you do with it? What can you do with the chords? Watch this. With your left hand, I want you to play an octave interval. If you go from C to C, where you have your pinky playing a C and your thumb playing a C, that's an octave interval. Now, what she's going to do, whatever the name of the chord is with my right hand, she's going to play that with her left hand. This is a C major triad. Okay. What I want her to do is just play C major with the right hand. With the left hand, she's going to play an octave interval. Now, for fun, I'm going to have her move one finger. We're going to have her move her pinky. Uh, well, keep your thumb on C, your middle finger on E, and your pinky is going to go to A. Okay. Is it top heavy or bottom heavy? Top. Top heavy. What note is on top? A. So she's going to play an A octave interval with her left hand. Okay? Now, just
just for fun, what we're going to do, I want you to put your thumb here and your middle finger there. Play those notes. What is it evenly spaced, top heavy, or bottom heavy? It's even. So if it's evenly spaced, the note on the bottom is the name of the chord. This is a D minor chord. Okay? Now, for fun, just move one finger. So let's move your thumb down from there. She's playing, she's playing, go back to the D minor. She's in root position. She's going to keep her third and fifth fingers where they are and just move her thumb down. Is it bottom heavy or top heavy now? It's bottom. Bottom heavy. So what note is on the bottom? Okay. Uh, if it's bottom heavy, what note is in the middle? F. F. So she's going to move her left hand to F. Go back to C. Yeah, you can play the C major chord if you want. Good. Now, move the pinky up here. And where does your left hand go? She's moving one note at a time. Watch this. We're going to try something. I want you to break apart the right hand. C major chord, my pinky goes up to A, so now I'm playing C, E, A, which is an A minor chord, first inversion. My left hand's going to go down to the A. C, A, C, A. Try that.
Well, guess what I do with my own students? I'll just give them a chord, and I'll call out a random chord and say C. E. A. D. F. G. And I'm just having them play different chords. Well, then I'll say, can you break it apart? I wanted to create 
a template of what I thought students should know or be able to do. So I came up with what I call my music motivation mentorship map. I have an apprentice stage, a maestro stage, and a virtuoso stage. And then I have listed music terminology, key signatures, notation, rhythm, intervals, scales, chords, modes, arpeggios, inversions, techniques, sight reading, ear training, music history, music improvisation, composition, and then what I think they should be able to do in each of those areas according to the apprentice stage, maestro stage, the virtuoso stage. Well, what I did initially is I created this checklist for my own students and I said, do you know all of your major key signatures, minor key signatures? Do you know all of your major, minor, diminished pentascales in all keys? Do you know all of your intervals, major scales, minor scales, one, two, three, four octaves, parallel and contrary motion? Do you know all your major triads, minor, diminished, augmented, spend the fourth, spend the second, major sixth, minor sixth, major seventh, minor, major seventh, dominant seventh, minor seventh, dominant seventh, minor seventh, flat the fifth, minor seventh, sharp the fifth, diminished seventh, major ninth, ninth chords, in all keys and in all inversions. And I just created a little checklist and we would check off when the students learned these things. Well, one student said, can't you just write it out for us so we can actually see everything in every key? And I said, okay, we'll do that. So I did this entire book where I wanted them to learn the circle of fifths, sharps, flats, and then we have a blank page that they can run off copies and practice filling in so they can learn what it is. My father, growing up, he had been a professional musician. We would be at Hobel Zoo, and he'd look at me and say, seven sharps, which key? And I'd say, <laughs> We're right in front of the giraffes, you know, I mean, this is, I don't know what key that is. And he has this loud snap. He has this really loud snap. He's like, come on, seven sharps, which key? And I just thought, damn, people are looking, you know, what, 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 what? I don't have music in front, I can't just look and see. What, so I had to memorize what they were. We'd be at the grocery store checking out, and he'd look at me and he'd say, seven sharps. Which key? And he'd start snapping. And so I would put this C sharp major to stop the snapping because I didn't want that snapping. And then he would say, What's the relative minor? I thought, Oh no, and the snapping would commence again and he'd start snapping again. Come on, what's the relative? You gotta know this, you gotta know this. So I, I had to learn it so I could figure out what it was, you know, where I would say, Oh, C sharp major, what is the relative minor? Oh, A sharp major. And, you know, so I had to go through and just have it in my mind. Because I knew his fingers would start snapping. And, no, I don't do that. I don't snap. But I went through and I created all major key signatures, all minor key signatures, and then each individual section, we have all of the major pentascales, minor pentascales, diminished pentascales, in every key. Then we go through each key signature where we do the major scale, contrary, the parallel motion, the intervals created from the scale, harmonic and melodic the triads blocked and broken with the primary cadence, the seventh chords blocked and broken, and then we do that in every key signature, where we go through every key doing that, and then we go through and do all major, minor, diminished, augmented, suspend the fourth, suspend the second, go through every single chord progression in every key, and what we're doing is we're doing root position, first inversion, second inversion, third inversion, when we have a third, and we go through every key signature doing that, blocked and broken. So it's something good for the students to learn how to do, because I would have students who would play the six chords, and then they would say, well, what, what can we do with it? You know, what, what do I do with it? And that's why I started saying, break it apart to get that walking bass feeling. And he said, how about I play the chord, and you 
you say each individual note from the chord while I play it, and we race that way. So I would have to say C, G, A, E, G, A, C. I would have to try racing with my mouth, and it was such a, especially when you get C sharp, sharp, you know, trying to get those sharps out. And I just thought, okay, the playing field has been leveled a little bit. It was so tough to C sharp, E sharp, G sharp, A sharp, B trying to quickly get those, and then do each individual inversion. E sharp, G sharp, A sharp, C sharp, A sharp, G sharp, and trying to get that down with my mouth while he was playing it, and it did help. He, he beat me many times doing it that way. But, we were trying to help him understand what to do with it. So I said, what if you do the walking bass, and you do root position, first inversion, second inversion, third inversion, Try something. C major six chord. Root position. First inversion. Second inversion. Third inversion. Back up to root. While you're doing the walking bass with the left hand. The left hand is doing. The, these are quarter notes, okay? If I had my bass in here, okay, we do the bass, and you're just like walking up the bass. That's what you're doing. They're quarter notes. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. Try it. 